Good evening. So we've been looking for the last number of weeks at the faults of the afflictions, at the many faults of the afflictions, in order to recognize how we are helpless under their control and therefore are leading us to develop a determination that we must strive to eradicate the afflictions entirely. <laughs> The term that we come across in the, this context of looking at the, the afflictions is the term of an enemy. So this term is usually applied to those who harm us, whether they harm us physically or they harm us emotionally. We, we think of them um, in, so take the word, this term enemy in a broader sense, but some uh, uh, someone, uh, we usually apply to someone who creates um, or who we perceive to be creating an unwanted situation, a situation that we perceive as unwanted or harmful. So whilst we usually apply this to other people, or we recognize as, as, um, situations as being um, um, harmful, actually in reality, our harm really comes from our afflictions. And therefore, if we are to identify an actual enemy, it's not other people, it's not other circumstances, it's our afflictions. And this is because our afflictions don't only harm us in this life. They harmed us in our life previous to this and our life previous to that. In fact, each and every life we've had thus far, the afflictions have harmed us. And they will harm us in lives to come too. It's these afflictions that have been harming us since beginning this time and will continue to harm us in innumerable ways. It's these afflictions that actually create our own samsara. So they are the actual enemy, the actual cause of our harm and suffering. <laughs> Pando Those um, that we normally consider to be our external, or those that are, are suitable to be called external enemies, such as other people or enemies, in reality, and you'll have this experience, is that our relationship with them 
can be changed. We can de uh, develop a friendship with, with someone who had previously caused us harm. And that, that way, radically change our relationship with them. That can and does happen, but it can never happen with our afflictions. Our afflictions, by their very nature, cause harm and can only cause harm. so as we've been looking at, our enemies, our actual enemy, does not abide externally, but internally. And where internally? Not in our body, really internally, in our mind, at our very hearts, the center of, our, of ourselves, at our mind. So the cause of all our innumerable problems is to be found here. In fact, we need to come to recognize that every problem, suffering or difficulty we have ever encountered or will do so comes from these own afflictions. And this is the reflection that we've been, Shantideva has been guiding us through over the last <coughs> number of weeks in this section. So as to, for us to come to recognize the danger and, the, and that they only pose danger these afflictions, in order to develop a deep and abiding determination, a joyous perseverance to strive and eradicate these afflictions entirely. <clears throat> that brings us then to the 35th verse. If the jailers of the prison of samsara, who in hell and other realms, also act as the executioners who kill me, reside in a web of attachment within my own mind, how, sh how shall I ever have peace and happiness living like this? <laughs> Nyomobadi, <laughs> Okay, the first line, <coughs> if the jailers of the prison of samsara, the, the jailers of this prison of samsara are actually our own afflictions. The afflictions abiding on our own continuum. So they uh, are uh, not, not only do our afflictions create our the, the create this uh, prison of samsara, but they are the prison guards who keep us bound within this prison, preventing us from fleeing our problems, sufferings, and difficulties. This is the the expansive role that the afflictions play. They lead to our, our creation of our prison of samsara and keep us bound within it. Meaning is that until we attain liberation from our samsara, in other words, until we destroy this very prison of suffering, 
we will continue to be bound within these suffering realms due to our afflictions. Therefore, it's our afflictions that we need to destroy. It's through destroying our afflictions that the entirety of our samsaric existence is eradicated. Sajidella Dunya Our freedom from samsara comes about through eliminating these afflictions because it's the afflictions which create our samsara and keep us bound within it. So, for example, to take or take as an example the affliction of attachment. If we live somewhere and we like it, we are attached to where we live, we're not going to want to leave. And it's, it's this liking or attachment to our, our place that will keep us there. So it's this attitude, this way of thinking, this mind of attachment or liking this place that keeps us there. But if, say, for example, through climate change, where we live becomes really quite difficult, doesn't rain enough or it rains too much, or it's uh, not hot enough or it's far too hot, whatever it may be, if we come to see that this place is actually unbearable, we will move. In fact, we'll flee from there. What has happened is our attachment to this, our, our residence, the, our attachment or liking for this residence is gone. And therefore, we readily m- move and we will move from there without hesitation. So this is where we need to come. We need to, through reflecting on the faults of the afflictions, as has been presented since about the 28th verse, through reflecting on the faults of the afflictions, develop this deep and abiding determination to gain freedom from them and thereby gain freedom from samsara, freedom from suffering. Gabriella,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你好,你
to rebirth in the lower realms, in realms such as, as the hell realms. So therefore, our afflictions, they play the role of, in, 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 of causing all our suffering through ensuring that all the karma we accumulate, virtuous and non-virtuous, is cont contaminated. Moreover, that the very fact we create non-virtuous karma is due to our afflictions. And then thirdly, it's these afflictions that ripen our, our karmic imprints at the time of death, potentially propelling us to the lower realms. And それ、The first line, if the jailer is for the prison of samsara, who in hell and other realms, the second line, mm. also act as the executioners who kill me. So here it's presented that it's our afflictions that have led us to accumulate non-virtuous karma. It's our afflictions that at the time of death will ripen a karmic imprint. And if it's non-virtuous, it will lead to rebirth in the lower realms, rebirth as an animal or as a spirit or in the hell realms. And it's there that we will suffer due to the karma that we have accumulated under the influence of our afflictions. So therefore, the afflictions act, not the second line, act as the ex executioners who kill me. So in other words, the suffering that we experience, for example, in hell, uh, uh, executioners who kill me, or as, for example, an animal, this is due to our own karma and afflictions. <laughs> Nina Dala Dewa Dewa Kala you said it, Chesan Kaldi Sigisi that new mobadi new body and chip mabambache, mabamba lola, mutu ya chawati new mobadi near the vaina, dinning new mob chawati ye and gasa drawana she drawari sta drawari chisan drawana kaldi lola nina drawan drawa dinali a near the vaina drawana near the vena and Third line, reside in a web of attachment within my own mind. So the afflictions pervade our mind like a web of attachment. And we, we are in court, we are caught within this web of attachments, bound within a web of attachments. We have no freedom. We have no freedom. And this is our very situation. These afflictions pervade our mind like a web of attachments. Therefore, we can experience no lasting physical or mental happiness in this lifetime or lifetimes to come, as long as we remain bound in this web of attachments that abides nowhere but within our own mind. <laughs> The <laughs> For all of us, we want to abide in happiness. No one wants to suffer. Recognizing this and recognizing that the cause of all our suffering are these own afflictions. And it's these afflictions that are not only the cause of our suffering, but they are what prevents us from attaining lasting happiness. Recognizing this, we develop a determination 
to no longer be deceived by these afflictions, but rather to strive to apply antidotes to them, because it's through the constant application of antidotes that we will we can eventually eradicate the afflictions. And when the afflictions are eventually eradicated, lasting happiness will be achieved. Dear So now with the final line, how shall I ever have peace and happiness living like this? This really is this recognition that as long as one is bound within this web of attachment, one can only expect to, to suffer. And therefore, one comes to the recognition to apply antidotes to eradicate the afflictions. Because even the, the mere fact that we have external uh, enemies is because of our afflictions. It's because of our afflictions we've created the causes to be in, in circumstances. It's because of our afflictions that we experience those circumstances in certain ways. So therefore, the the uh, afflictions serve as the, these internal enemies, the afflictions serve as both the cause that lead to us having external enemies as well as a ripening condition for our response, our afflicted response to them, exacerbating problems, making them ever worse. <coughs> Uh So with our external enemies, whether humans or animals, there is uh, techniques by which one can deal with those situations and either deal with the situation on a temporary uh, basis so as not to make it worse, or one can, through repeated efforts, radically change our relationship with, with someone. For example, if someone regularly is giving us a hard time, if we respond with kindness and we don't hold a grudge, hold, hold a grudge against what they've done before, for example, we can change our relationship with others. So with external en enemies, this is possible. But with internal en enemies, with afflictions, this cannot be done. <coughs> <coughs> ジャンダンアンジュギニョモバデカワヨラシネンアンジュセミテンドユデレジャンダンアンジュチャウンウンネンドニョモバデセンドニョモバシエデンアンジュギナミュンアンジュサンマタデニョモバデハコゴマジャ
ได้ยอมมองไปที่ตางอยู่ชะซะยอมมองไปชิกอไปนะได้ได้คอนโทรเซียดิกันชิกอริสิได้คอนโทรเซียดิงาจุกิสิมคอนมาจิบิสิมเ
So when a still slight destroys our happiness, we may be in a good mood, having a lovely day with friends, but when anger arises, that is lost. And if, if perhaps when we are alone and the anger is strong, we may even destroy our possessions, a valued, cherished possession in a, in a, in a fit of rage, we may destroy that. And when we are with others, almost certainly any expression of our anger will bring harm to others. Even a mere uh, changing of our facial expression will cause apprehension in others, especially if, if we are habituated to anger, if we have a reputation for anger. This will, will cause fear to arise in, in, the, in, in other people. Merely the changing of our facial expression can cause harm like this. And when speaking with a mind that is angry, we will speak in an unkind manner, probably in a harsh manner, and even if we are saying something, something that does need to be said, the way we will say it is likely to cause harm. Moreover, when anger is strong and one has lost restraint, one may even physically harm someone, assault them. So all of this comes from our mind of anger, from an, an individual's mind of anger. Not only do they suffer, but they bring suffering to others. They add to the burden of suffering that others bear. And in this way, we may destroy previously harmonious relationships, causing others to avoid us, to have a bad reputation, and others to fear us. So this we need to reflect on again and again, not just merely accept it as obvious, but develop to reflect on it repeatedly, to develop a determination that as soon as one notices notices the mind moving in the direction of anger to apply antidotes. So for that determination to come, one needs to develop a deep, um, a clear understanding that even slight anger, but certainly stronger anger, only brings harm to oneself and others. Pangudus This reflection needs to be done so that the faults of the individual affliction, in this case anger, are abundantly clear to one, leading to one seeing anger as only ever harmful. And this is an important conclusion to come to because, again, through social influence, anger is often presented, when certain circumstances presented, as justified. We need to come to recognize it never is. And we need to come to the point where we have a deep and stable determination to abandon anger, to turn away from it. Then one has the, the strength of mind, the inner conviction to apply the antidotes, to eradicate, one, uh, to free oneself from, from anger. So and again, because if one doesn't vivid, vividly uh, see the faults of anger, we will still have this delusion, thinking that at times anger is my friend. Why? Because it protects me. It protects me when I'm challenged by others, when when um, when I, I'm perhaps in a threatening situation or um, I'm being undermined. So we do have the, this mistaken view of sometimes believing anger is our friend. It provides us protection, giving us strength. We need to, therefore, come to recognize that under no circumstances is anger ever a friend. Does anger ever provi- provide protection? 
세상은就卡拉鲁西呢，苏苏里啊，确定了，女儿卡拉吉卡拉西姆鲁西呢，对，女儿伊么就呢，军人什么嘛，他妈的啊，西姆鲁西，苏苏里潘多伊么就是啥
Chizan this meditation is where we first look at the falsehood afflictions in relation to our own lived experience and thereby develop a determination to gain freedom of them through cultivating the antidotes. So this is the sequence. And it's imperative that one start, uh, trains in the sequence because what it leads to is one coming to understand one's own mind well, coming to know oneself well. And where this is so, so important is it, through understanding one's own, own, own mind well, we will have an understanding of the mind of others too, knowing how our, our mind works. We will understand how others' minds work too. So, for example, if one has trained well in reflecting on the faults of anger and developed a determination not to become angry, but rather to have a loving, compassionate attitude towards others, and one is developing that, then when, let's say, for example, one meets someone who speaks to us, speaks to us in a harsh manner, in an unkind manner, maybe pointing out our faults, and in such a situation we know there is a real likelihood of anger arising within us. But if we have trained well, immediately what will come to mind is that this person is angry because it's manifestly clear from their tone of voice, their choices of, choice, choice of words, their facial expression. More, knowing that this person is angry and having reflected well on the faults of anger as well as on love and compassion, immediately we'll understand that this person is suffering. Their, mind, their anger has destroyed their own peace of mind. And being a, a, a person subject to anger, that anger will have harmed their relationships with others. That anger will lead to them struggling to sleep on occasion, leading to them losing their appetite on occasion. So we'll know that that is the case with this person, even if, even if we have never met them before, because we have come to recognize within ourselves the faults that anger, uh, the faults of anger. And because we have also trained in love and compassion, immediately knowing this person is suffering, compassion for them will arise. Compassion being, being defined as the wish for them to be freed of suffering. So we all know they're suffering, and therefore the wish for them to be free of anger will arise. This then leads to our mind being patient. Patience is a mind defined as a mind that stays undisturbed in the face of adversity. So here is the verse, the, the adversity is a person speaking unkindly to us. And our mind is undisturbed because compassion is dominant for the suffering being before us. Now with patience and compassion dominant within, we can respond in a skillful way, in a way to ease the suffering of this person. And that is the fulfillment of our wish of compassion. This mind of compassion is wanting this person not to suffer. And that will guide how we respond to this angry person. 
Ngan 不过,我们可以先去上,去了,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过,不过
Then continuing to look at the need and the importance of changing our mind, transforming our mind, come to the 36th verse in the fourth chapter. Thus, until this enemy has been manifestly and definitely subjugated, for that long I will not forsake striving at this, becoming enraged at a harm that is just slight and short-lived. Those lofty with pride do not rest until they have triumphed. Uh, Looking at the first two lines, thus until this enemy has been manifestly and definitely subjugated, Thus, this, the, until this enemy, this enemy, of course, rem, rem, uh, points to our inner enemy, in fact, our soul enemy, these afflictions. Thus, until this enemy, our afflictions, has been manifestly and definitely subjugated. So this then is referring, when we say manifestly and definitely, Shantideva is saying that until the enemy, the, the afflictions have been completely eradicated, so not merely subdued or pacified, but their seeds uh, uh, have been completely eradicated until then. Mm-hmm. <coughs> Majumba <coughs> The, in the first line, we have until this, until this enemy has been manifestly and definitely subjugated. So this links with what we've been looking at, that the afflictions only ever harm. It's not that the afflictions sometimes are our friends. Their very nature is to cause suffering. That's all they do, cause suffering now and in lives to come. They cause suffering for ourselves, and through us, suffering for others. So this is, then is the meaning that until this enemy, so in other words, even when we, we starting to become skilled in our mind training, don't become complacent. Until they have been manifestly and definitely subjugated, these enemies will cause us pain and misery. So never be complacent. Then Santideva continues in the second line, for that long I will not forsake striving at this. So one continuously but also with joy, one strives to eradicate these afflictions. So from now until they can never arise again because they've been removed from my mind without leaving a trace. Until then, with joyous perseverance, I will strive at eradicating these afflictions. <laughs> Nimbotilpa, 
And the way to subjugate the afflictions is through applying antidotes. Merely wishing for them to depart will not, will not help. We need to apply antidotes. In other words, develop contrary mind ways of thinking. And we need to do so consistently so that our afflictions have nowhere to abide in our mind. In other words, they have no um, alternative way to deceive us, to appear in the guise of friends, but recognize they are only harmful. And until they have been manifestly and definitely subjugated, I must strive in forsaking them or in eradicating them. And Mia the meaning is that all our problems, each and every one, every experience of suffering, every difficulty that we ever have experienced in this life and we will continue to experience until our death comes, as well as all the suffering we bring to others, as well as in lives to come. All of this is due to our afflictions. And this has always been the case and will always be the case, both in these uh, higher realms, such as we are born in now, as well as in the lower realms. Every experience of suffering is due to the afflictions. And as long as we remain bound in samsara, because it's these very afflictions that bind us in samsara, we will suffer. With this recognition, then, we develop the determination that with enthusiasm, with a, a, a joy, I will persevere. And my perseverance will be in applying antidotes. Antidotes for when the afflictions are starting to arise, and certainly antidotes when they're strong. Never accepting their presence, but continuously striving to eradicate them until they are completely eradicated. Mm-hmm. Da now moving to the third and fourth line in the 36th verse. Becoming enraged at harm that is just slight and short-lived. So if we think of just, just about most things that have disturbed our peace of mind, almost all of it falls into this category. Things that are just slight and short-lived. For example, when we hear harsh speech, when someone either criticizes us or berates us, 
This, at the time, may be a big deal, but in reality, it's just sound. Sound, to which we apply a variety of meanings. And in response to this slight and short-lived harm, pride arises. And this pride, then, is expressed in us feeling the need to stand up and defend ourselves, to respond in a way that puts that other person in, in their place, that ensures that they do not speak to me like that again. We walk away from this triumph, perhaps quivering a bit inside, perhaps that night struggling to enjoy our meal, struggling to sleep. What kind of victory is this? What kind of wisdom is this? Is <laughs> Then Jesa Taking these two lines in and reflecting on, on the meaning in terms of our own lived experience is the way to approach the Dharma. Reflects on how when, for example, hearing a speech from others, think about what it is that is what led to this arisal in you, this response. And you'll see a variety of things. All that ever appears to your mind in, in the context of speech is mere sound. But then one has a response to that. But prior to one's emotional response, be independence on labeling uh, particular words and meaning behind that those words com that comes from independence on the tone, uh, the facial expression, and so forth. We impute a vast amount of meaning onto mere sound. And from that then comes our emotional response. Often, pride arises, this puffed-up sense of needing, uh, that then leads us to feeling that there's some abiding I to defend. And perhaps th then this will be in, uh, compounded by a resentment that we have carried, we're carrying forth. A resentment based on either our relationship with this individual or with others who have spoken to us in this way or have pointed out the same fault. And this leads to this ex even more greater exaggerated response. So when we recall such an event, recognize that our actual enemy there is not that person, but the afflictions on our own continuum. And recognize how our response is completely out of proportion. All that came to us was sound. And we had this whole internal explosion, whereas one could have handled it completely differently if one had been skillful and applying antidotes. Thereby, train your mind to how better to respond skillfully. And the next thing is that the human body is in a control that the child control and the human body is going to do to stay to do in a tiny gun to do that they live on what to us in the bond to tell you a target bond to get some then you do by you then you do by you do they buy a get a problem with a business or a city or a city so that the next time uh 
Günce ceza dedi ki çekim yasın bir sürüm son ödü. Ceza dedi ki samlo son ödü. Samlo de gibi çoğlu son ödü. Jel ya ne bu çekim yasın ve samlo dağı ödü. Yani jel ya pembe samlo de camzı ki samlo de leye ki kusu görü. Ceza ne bu son ceza. Ceza da jel ya ancak ki dedi ki samlo de gibi çoğlu dağı ödü. Sem gibi çoğlu dağı ödü. Jel ya günce çekim çizgü çekim de ne bu çekim samlo sem de mi gibi çoğlu dağı ödü. Ceza sem Ceza mi gibi çözdü? Ceza sen mi gibi çözdü? Patan ile kaçın, sen mi gibi çözdü? Bayi din görüsü de gibi çözdü, tan görüsü de. Lüngü yüzü mü gönü şenler de bacı gibi sen de 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 Diğeri diye onu diyor, anne anne söyle, kontrol ediyor, çöndü ya da, anne yumma bu çöndü ya, anne dini ki samla de kibir samla dini ki yani yani samla de samla de ki, ne var çöp çerçeve duracak, anne anne söyle, tabata temiz kibir kovatıyor yani, tağınların ya duracak şey olur mu? Çünkü dini zaten yumma bu ya da semli ya da kanca da da yumma bu di, yumma bu dini dini yorulsun, da canlı bir şey zor di, karı kovasın anne söyle, şehir ya ne bacak mı ya sen bir samla çıkma, şehir ya pek bir çok insan bir samla di, di tango göre sade zor diyor bu adam di. So thus far, we've, uh, I've referenced a few afflictions, attachments, anger, and now we see pride and resentment also brought up. So we need to develop this determination to eradicate the afflictions. For that determination to have meaningful strength, we have to have recognized the faults in the afflictions. Coming to see that at all times, in all circumstances, they are harmful. They are never acceptable or justified, whatever the circumstances. By developing this determination, we will want to apply antidotes. We will not want to be deceived anymore, and thereby we will have the strength of mind not only to engage in, in the meditations, but also the strength of mind that throughout our day to be mindful of our own mental process, ensuring that we guard against the arisal of the afflictions. So we, we are in the context of the Bodhisattva training in, in conscientiousness. So all the trainings of a Bodhisattva, which are often presented as condensed in the six perfections, these, are, uh, these serve as antidotes to the afflictions. So let's look at the first, that of ethical restraint of which conscientiousness um, is, is a part. Ethical restraint is, develop, is the, uh, the determination to restrain ourselves from being unethical, to restrain ourselves within the confines of what is ethical. So one starts by restraining our physical behavior, builds on this through restraining our verbal speech, our speech, so that We are not unethical through how we act or speak. And then we, we, and we also train the most difficult of all, but the most important of restraining our mind so that our mind stays within the confines of what is ethical, is restrained within the confines of what is ethical. So we develop in the context of the practices of a bodhisattva this determination. I will not harm at the very least. I will not do harm to others. And wherever I can, I will bring benefit. So in the context here, we can develop this determination. I will not physically harm others, and I will not verbally harm others. And to the best, because those two are easier to, uh, those determinations are easier to fulfill. But we should also have the determination to keep trying to restrain our mind from even think having harsh thoughts towards others, and overcome, therefore, an expression of harmful intent. The way to do so is both to develop this determination not to bring harm, and also to develop the determination to benefit. So in this context, we develop the determination to rather relate to others with affection, with love and care and compassion. And thereby, when we are in situations where others act in a way 
we don't appreciate, whether it's towards us or just in general, that we rather develop a response that is pervaded by love and compassion for them through seeing them uh, as, as having value and not uh, as, as someone who should act in accordance with my wishes. So the virtuous mental factor of conscientiousness, and this is the uh, chapter that we are in, the fourth chapter is a chapter of conscientiousness. It is that which enables us to be committed, not to respond in the usual manner, but rather to respond in an ethical manner, to respond while staying within the, the restraints of what is ethical. And rather, therefore, than responding in an afflicted way, to respond by expressing the antidotes that we have been training in. So rather have our response be a reflection of our training than a reflection of our habitual tendencies, our afflicted tendencies. So by engaging in these meditations again and again, these wholesome, virtuous uh, minds start to become ever more um, dominant within. They start to become part of our personalities, part of who we are. They grow in strength. And this makes it ever easier to respond in wholesome ways and ever more sincere. So when we're seeing this change in ourselves, recognize these are signs of our progression towards the attainment of enlightenment, our attainment of liberation from suffering. So what this training comes down to in brief is the Bodhisattva determination to bring no harm, but rather to be of benefit in all circumstances. え、サムロディアポチマチョバネ、カンバナロスジチブデナイキウメバレ、チソナニョムデジエナイキウメ、キウメチャデロワ。チザドサムロディ、ヤポチタントベネ、アネ、サンビチョデ、ケウチョ、
will be one of care and friendship. So this is what we must strive to get to. Because the mistake that we make, the mistake of society, is to believe that our enemies lie around us. And if only I could vanquish my external enemies, I would be happy. But when we look back on our life, we know when we've left one situation because that situation brought us unhappiness, we went elsewhere, we encountered a similar situation again because our mind follows us. If there's someone we don't get on with and we have nothing to do with them again, we find another person we don't get on with because our mind accompanies us. But by changing our mind, subduing our mind, subduing the afflictions, through developing wholesome minds, wherever we go, whether we are alone or with others, we are happy. Our mind is peaceful, whether we are in a peaceful environment or in a bustling, noisy environment. Our mind stays still. So therefore, I want to emphasize the importance of changing our mind, because it's through our mind that we experience the world. So then, thank you. We can conclude there for tonight. But if there are any questions, then we, we can, we have time for questions. Sure. Hello. Um, I just wanted to ask, you know how it's not good to be angry, um, but then when you look at the Did <laughs> Uh, the way that you describe is is perfect. It's really very, very good. Because whilst you are angry, there's not much you can do. Because the, the, the fault of the afflictions, amongst the faults of the afflictions, they obscure our wisdom or our intelligence, our capacity to think in an unafflicted manner because our mind is dominated by the afflictions. So therefore, one needs to separate oneself. And when calm, then one can deal with things. So when in a situation of anger with any other afflictions, it's really important afterwards to review what happened and apply the antidotes in the way that has been described. 
This is so important. And also with that is uh, the commitment, I do not want to be angry again. So that commitment, and then with uh, following that, then train in the antidote. So for example, take that circumstance and think, how better could I have trained? How better could I have responded? So that when you are in that same situation again, and you will be in a similar situation again, if you have reflected many times on a more skillful way to respond, that is what will, you'll be reminded of. And you'll be able to respond in the way you've trained rather than the, in the way you would have responded habitually before. And the other thing to add is if you know you are going into a situation where uh, anger or another affliction may well arise, a meeting that's going to be challenging, prepare your mind beforehand how to respond with the likely afflictions. Then you're less likely to be afflicted, but can deal with it skillfully. So in brief, see the faults of the afflictions. Secondly, develop the determination not to come under the influence of the afflictions again. And then thirdly, train in the antidotes, become habituated to the antidotes. And this includes thinking of how better to deal with that particular situation. And then do have that, that reflection many times so that one does then uh, one is then able to respond skillfully in the future. Eh, <laughs> As part of your, uh, of your morning practice, I encourage you then to think about your day ahead because there will be circumstances that you can recognize beforehand that you'll find a cha a cha a challenging later in the day particularly in terms of anger, but also attachments and perhaps other afflictions, that you recognize that you are going into a situation where you are in danger. You're in danger of the afflictions arising. So plan beforehand how to deal with that situation, what you expect to happen. And then set the mental determination to remind yourself before you in engage in that situation how to deal with it. Again, like if it's a particular meeting that, that you have or whatever it may be, then before you, 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 you go into that situation of danger, remind yourself of that meditation. Remind yourself of your commitment uh, of not to come under the, the, the influence of the afflictions because they only cause harm, but rather to rely on the antidotes that you had reflected on that morning. And by doing this, you are taking your, your meditation into your daily life. You're taking the Dharma into your daily life. And this is how we change our minds. This is how we develop good mental habits and we have a better impact in the world. Cameron, you had a question? Oh, um, yes. uh, just a, I was looking to see if Emma has a short phrase that can be used on the spot for a mental antidote for resentment. So the idea of resenting somebody doing something mm -hmm. that was harmful. Just some sort of short phrase. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't think it should be done. Uh, 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 let me give that some thought. There certainly will be something. I just need to give it some thought. And, and next time, I'll, I'll bring that. <laughs> okay. And thank you very much.